Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death. This episode is on my playlist, Deadly Destinations, where we visit the sites of terrible events. Today, I'm coming to you from Santa Barbara, California, where a serial killer stalked the area and took his victims. I'm gonna take you on a little tour of the area. We're gonna talk about the crimes, and of course, we're gonna eat here. I'm Stacy Lee, let's begin. Welcome to Santa Barbara, California. I've said it before in these videos because we spend a lot of time in California. This is another one of those quintessential California beach towns. Santa Barbara is absolutely everything you think of when you think of a California coastal city. To say this is a beautiful city would be an understatement. It is simply stunning. It is a postcard, a painting. It's just about as perfect as it gets. Now, you'll pay a pretty penny to live here. New York City's got nothing on Santa Barbara. Living expenses here are 12% higher than in downtown Manhattan, and that's without rent. With rent, you're looking at around 18% higher costs of living than New York City. This is a bougie place full of people with lots of money and it shows. It shows in the city and it shows in the buildings and it shows in the retail areas. Everywhere you look, the grounds are perfectly manicured. The trees and the flowers and the grasses are beautifully maintained and it feels like a tropical paradise here. The downtown area is also fabulous. We walked the streets one night while we were here. They had a little street festival and it was so cute. We wandered among the shops and bought a few trinkets from the vendors. People were out riding their bikes and just enjoying the spring night air. The palm trees are lit with string lights and it's very festive. The shops stay open late. Just a really great little downtown area. The beaches, again, are something out of a painting or a postcard. The sands are white and the water is blue, and we very much enjoyed walking on the beaches and sitting in the warm sand, just enjoying the ocean breeze and a lazy day. Sometimes you just need a lazy day, right? When you do nothing at all, and there is no better place for a lazy day than at the beach. We don't have beaches where I live, so I make sure to soak it all up. There are vendors on the boardwalk selling everything from jewelry to fresh fruit to handmade clothing. And I think that's one of the things I love so much about California, lots and lots of vendors. I'd much rather spend my coins with a local shopkeep than with a big company. So I really enjoy these little markets. The views are breathtaking, and as we wandered, we spotted this little German brew house. We're a couple of suckers for a great snack and a handcrafted beer, so we stopped in. We grabbed a giant house-made pretzel, which was outstanding, soft and chewy and delicious, and we also tried the fried cheese curds. These things were dangerously good, crispy on the outside and rich and chewy on the inside. And of course, we grabbed a couple of beers. This was gluten overload for me and I paid for it for about three days. But you know, you have to live life, right? We only get one go around and I'm going to enjoy mine. This was just one of many fabulous eateries and bars in this area. We're going to take you to a couple more later in the episode. Santa Barbara was first inhabited by the Chumash people and their ancestors go back 13,000 years. The oldest human skeleton ever discovered in North America was unearthed on Santa Rosa Island, about 30 minutes from downtown Santa Barbara. Spanish explorers came to the area first in 1542 and anchored in the area known as Galeta. Subsequent expeditions in the 16 and 1700s led to the building of the very famous mission that stands here today. In part, some of it was destroyed by the earthquake. I would have loved to take you inside, but they do not allow filming. In the 1800s, settlements began to pop up, but many were destroyed by the earthquake of 1812. In 1822, Spanish rule ended with the loss of the Mexican War of Independence, and Santa Barbara became a territory of Mexico. In 1846, the Mexican-American War saw the area turned over to the states, and soon it was gold rush fever here. During the 1850s, Santa Barbara was a wild and violent place. There were gunfights in the streets and racially motivated lynchings. By the 1870s, the town had grown and become more civilized. The beautiful Santa Barbara Arlington Hotel was built, and then the oil barons moved in. 
There's a lot of oil in these waters. Then came the film industry. Here you see Santa Barbara police officers acting as extras in a production. After World War II, the population boomed by over 10,000 in a very short period of time, and the infrastructure had to be beefed up to support all the new residents. Soon, it was a serene and beautiful beach town surviving on industry and tourism. Of all the Central California towns we visited, I think Santa Cruz and Santa Barbara are my favorites. I love Monterey as well. They're all very beautiful and peaceful, and the people are just as beautiful as the places are. The vibe in these cities is so chill, so laid back, very much do your own thing and let others do theirs. And that is 100% my mindset, so I really enjoy the atmosphere. But we know that no matter how beautiful or how tranquil or how expensive any city is, there are bad people who live there and there are people who do terrible things. Santa Barbara is no exception. This is Thor Nice Christensen, and he was an actual monster. Thor is one of those killers that I'm always surprised more people don't know more about because the things he did are worth all of the publicity given to the well-known serial killers. Thor Christiansen was born on December 28, 1957 in Denmark, and he emigrated to the United States when he was five years old. His family first settled in Inglewood and then moved to Solvang, where Thor's father ran a restaurant. Thor didn't have that troubled childhood we hear so often about with serial killers, which only makes the conversation about what makes a serial killer more fascinating. He did really well in school when he was younger, but then something in Thor changed. It was very troubling for his parents and for his teachers alike. When Thor was a junior in high school, he started to go downhill very quickly. He stopped doing his homework and he stopped attending his classes, and then he abruptly dropped out altogether. His parents were very unhappy with his decisions, and so Thor moved out of the family house and got a job at a gas station to support himself. During this time, he started gaining a lot of weight very quickly, and soon he weighed almost 300 pounds. We know from other cases that a sharp decline in health or hygiene or a major change in appearance can be an indicator of serious mental illness, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's what Thor was experiencing. He was not doing well, and the people around him could see that. Then women began being murdered in the Santa Barbara area, and very soon police realized they were looking for a serial killer. The victims all looked very similar, so similar that the press was calling the crimes the look-alike murders. Most of the victims were female students at the University of California, Santa Barbara. The first victim was 21-year-old Jacqueline Rook. She was abducted from a bus stop in the suburb of Galetta on December 6, 1976. For weeks, family, friends, and police looked for Jackie, and then sadly, they found her, but not in the way they had hoped to. Jackie's body was discovered on January 20th, 1977, in Refugio Canyon. Poor Jackie's family had been desperate. They'd even contacted a psychic, who promised the family that Jackie would be home by Christmas. Well, that didn't happen. Because it took a while to find Jacqueline's body, she was actually the second confirmed victim of the killer. On the same day that Jackie went missing, a Galetta waitress named Mary Saris disappeared. Both Jackie and Mary were still missing on January January 18th, 1977, when a third woman went missing. On the 18th, 21-year-old Patricia Laney disappeared from yet another bus stop. Patricia's body was found the day after her vanishing in Refugio Canyon, which made her the first victim to be discovered. When Patricia's body was found, police were on alert. This was not a typical event in Santa Barbara. The murder rate is very low, and these kinds of murders, where women are found dumped, are very, very rare. When Jackie's body was found, also in Refugio Canyon, the police were quite sure they had a serial killer on their hands. Each victim had been killed by a single shot to the head fired from a small caliber pistol. Mary Sarah's remains were not found until May 22, 1977, and by that time they were mostly skeletonized, but investigators could obviously still tell she had been shot in the head. 
As the bodies began to turn up, the police dove in questioning dozens and then hundreds of men. One of the men questioned was Thor Christiansen. He had received a citation for possession of alcohol by a minor, and because he had even this small record, he was questioned. Police did not consider him a suspect at the time, even though they found a 22 caliber pistol in his car. They felt Thor was just a teenaged punk kid who liked to drink, and they pretty much wrote him off. Then on April 18, 1979, 24-year-old Lydia Preston, some sites have her listed as Linda, was hitchhiking near Hollywood. Sadly, Thor Christiansen was the one to pick her up. Lydia got in the car with Thor and they traveled several blocks. Suddenly, Thor pulled out a gun, pointed it, and shot Lydia in the left ear. But fortunately, the bullet was not aimed right at her head. Lydia Preston managed to jump out of the car while it was moving and while she was bleeding profusely and run for help. She ran to the nearest house and the residents called for help. Thor was in a panic and he drove off in the opposite direction. A few weeks later, on May 26, 1979, the decomposed body of 22-year-old Laura Benjamin was found near Big Tujunga Dam in a drainage culvert. She too had been shot in the head. The police were at a standstill. They had a maniac on the loose, and they had no leads, no suspects, and for a while, it seemed as if the cases might go cold. But then, Lydia Preston, who had recovered from her bullet wound, was in a bar in Hollywood in July of 1979. As she was sitting, having some drinks, her heart almost stopped when she saw her shooter walk into the bar. Thor Christiansen was out trolling for more victims. Lydia stood up and walked to the payphone in the bar. She called the police, who arrived within minutes. Cops entered the bar, and based on Lydia's eyewitness identification, they arrested Thor Christiansen. He was taken into custody and booked with a half million dollar bond. He was charged with the murders of Patricia Laney, Jacqueline Rook, and Mary Saris. Later, on August 20th, 1979, he was charged with the murder of Laura Benjamin, and then he was charged with the attempted murder of Lydia Preston. On December 26, 1979, for the Los Angeles area crimes, Thor Christiansen entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. He was scheduled to go on trial in February of 1980. The trial was delayed, and then in March, he withdrew his double plea in favor of a diminished capacity defense. But that didn't fly. A psychiatrist testified that Thor had engaged in provisional planning for the murders and stated that this showed he was not, in fact, acting from a place of diminished capacity. During the trial that followed, Thor admitted that he had an explosive temper, that he was a chronic drug user, and also he was a necrophiliac. He had engaged in acts of necrophilia with each of his victims. On May 14, 1980, Thor Christiansen was sentenced to 25 years to life for the murder of Laura Benjamin, and he got nine years for the attempted murder of Lydia Preston. Thor had a second trial in Santa Barbara. It began on May 28, 1980, and to everyone's surprise, Thor stood at the beginning and pled guilty to all three counts of murder in the Santa Barbara area. He was sentenced to life in prison for the murders of Jacqueline Rook, Patricia Laney, and Mary Saris. Thor was led off to prison, but he didn't make it even a year. On March 30, 1981, Thor Christiansen was stabbed to death in Folsom State Prison. His killer was never identified. His psychiatrists actually predicted his murder, stating he was young, he was blonde, and his last victim had been a black woman. They knew he was going into prison with a target on his back. It's kind of a shame that we don't know more about this killer. His psychopathy is interesting, and although not unique, more rare than many serial killers. There isn't a lot of information about this man, but what we do know is terrifying. He killed women simply to have access to their dead bodies. Even in a beautiful place like Santa Barbara, the most ugly of deeds is possible. Now, as we always do, we eat in our deadly destination. This is a dark travel show, and we always incorporate an element of food into our journey. This is Dining with Death. We started our evening here at one of Santa Barbara's most iconic restaurants, simply called the Santa Barbara Fish House. 
This beautiful restaurant sits right across the street from the beach and has magnificent water views. We sat outside and really enjoyed that view, along with the cool air, almost chilly, that blows in off the water. We started out with these gorgeous peach mojitos that were absolutely delicious. I had to go and ask the bartender what type of peach infusion he was using because it was so good. And it's hard to get an intense flavor with peach but wow, these were amazing. This was right on the cusp of oyster season. I don't eat oysters in the summer, so you know I had to get one last plate for the season, and oh my goodness, these were so good. I love a fresh oyster. I ordered the macadamia crusted halibut over Spanish rice, and it was delicious. Could have used a bit more seasoning, especially in the crust, but the fish was flaky and tender, and I really love it when they put peas in the rice. The rice was great, so was the bok choy. I love a little microgreens garnish on top, but I always feel it should be lightly dressed. This one was not. You know, just a little olive oil and balsamic, give it a little zhuzh. Jason had chiopino and it was fabulous, full of clams and mussels, fresh calamari, some crabs, some scallops, all in a very rich and flavorful tomato sauce. The flavors in California at a lot of these places are very subtle and sometimes it borders on under seasoned. This was all under seasoned for me, but the food was very fresh and what a gorgeous little spot, right? The patio is just everything you want in a beautiful restaurant by the beach. After dinner, we wandered a bit and asked some locals where the best place to get a nightcap was. And did we ever hit the jackpot? We love a tiki bar, like love, love a tiki bar. And this is one of the best we've ever been to. This is Test Pilot and we are obsessed. Look at the decor. We love a dark, dank bar, and this is as dark and dank as it gets. Not a dive bar, but nice and dark and cozy, very tropical. It's very small inside, so they have this outdoor patio with a food truck for bites to eat and extra seating. We ordered a zombie and a banana kappa, and the drinks were out of this world. You know, when there are ancient looking bottles of rum with labels you've never seen before, you're getting the good stuff. Such a fun place and definitely one to hit if you're ever in this area. These drinks were everything. Santa Barbara is a one-of-a-kind place in this world. It is everything you love and want in California surf town culture. It is beautiful, it is scenic, and it is also home to one of the most deranged serial killers the world has ever known. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, Deadly Destinations. Hit the like button if you liked the video, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me, and of course you can join my Patreon, that is a huge help. Thanks for spending part of your day with me, stay safe my friends, and be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.